This week on Newsmakers, his first two years as Central New York's congressman have produced a lot of legislative success, and it's also brought out no fewer than three Democrats who want to make John Catco's freshman term his last. Today, we'll talk with the Republican Catco about the state of the nation, the state of politics, and his case for re-election in the 24th Congressional District. Hi, everybody. Dan Cummings here once again. Welcome to Newsmakers. Very good to have you. If you're a regular viewer of this program, and I know you are, you have already seen all three Democrats who are challenging for the nomination in the 24th this year. We'll see at least them one more time before the end of June when they primary each other to see who will challenge our guest today. We welcome to our program incumbent Republican Congressman John Katko from the 24th Congressional District. John, thanks for being here. Glad to be back again. We, uh, I talk about politics at the top because it is a political year. It's an election year. And I want to start at the top of the ticket. Have you yet decided whether or not you will back any of the existing Republican presidential candidates? And if so, who and why? Well, I haven't endorsed any, any Republican pre presidential candidates yet, primarily because even though we've been this far into the process, how much discussion has there really been on the substantive issues that are affecting Americans' jobs and the economy, health care, uh, ISIS, how exactly, what, what are the details of their plans to address all those issues? And until I hear that, I'm not ready to endorse anybody at this time. Is there anything you've heard from any of the remaining three that would uh, impress you as a serious candidate, one you might want to hear more from? Oh, sure. Any time to talk about how to, def about ISIS and the threat ISIS is and, rate and understanding how serious a threat it is, I listen to them. They've all been talking about that. They've all been talking about jobs and the economy. They talk about how they want to restart the economy with tax reform and what have you. Great. But what, what the devil's in the details and what are the details? And so I think they all have uh, generally uh, good principles, but we, let's hear what exactly, exactly how they're going to go about doing it because that's really how they're going to distinguish themselves. If they can't distinguish themselves on the plans, how can you tell who's going to be the most effective leader for us? Going Mr. Forward? Cox, the chairman of the state Republican committee, this week, 48 hours after the results were, were clear in the New York primary, got on board with Donald Trump. He said, this was my strategy all along. Let the voters decide. It wouldn't have been fair for the state committee to take a position. But now he's my guy. He's a businessman. He's the best one to beat Clinton. You're not ready to, to, uh, to support any of the three or anyone else for that matter. No, I'm not. Endorsement. It supports a different thing. I mean, whoever the uh, Republican nominee is, I'm going to support. I'm, I'm going to do the same whoever thing. Whoever it is. Whoever it is. And uh, well, I'm going to maintain my independent strength there like I've done since I've been in Congress. And whether or not this is a Republican or a Democrat, I'm going to point out the differences I have with the presidential candidates, whether they're big or small. And, uh, but, but nevertheless, whoever the Republican nominee is, I absolutely will support. Not to draw, you're not ready to be drawn out today, but can you see running with uh, Donald Trump at the top of the ticket? Many Republicans would run in the other direction and already have. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't run the other direction. I mean, if he's on a ticket, he's on a ticket, and, you know, we're going we're gonna to work with what we have. And I think that he has a lot of good principles, and he's, he's tapping into something in this country in a, that a lot of people feel uh, disenfranchised. They feel like the professional politician is not serving them well. And I think they're going to have a stark contrast. If Trump is a nominee, the stark contrast is going to be the professional politician and, and, and the Democratic nominee, uh, Hillary Clinton, versus someone who is a businessman his entire life who is going to go out and uh, uh, think, think outside the box. The problem is, can he deliver that message without offending people? And that's what we have to uh, deal with going forward. Could I ask you a couple of just process, process questions politically sure. before we move on? There are those who are saying even if he doesn't win enough delegates to secure a first ballot nomination, if he comes in, as he almost certainly will, with a large majority of delegates, the most delegates of anybody, that is, that he should be given the nomination anyway. Well, I tell you what, if it, if it gets to a point where he's within a few a few votes of the nomination, he's, he's just uh, minimally short, and he's four or 500 votes more than the next closest competitor, how do, you not, how do you deny the will of the people and something like that? I just don't see that as being appropriate. But we're, we're kind of venturing in uncharted territories here, and there's a lot of variables to left before now and the end of time. Some of, them, some of them are un, un, uh, untied delegates and some are committed delegates. So it's going to be an interesting. Like in Pennsylvania, I just realized the, uh, today they have some, a, a good majority of delegates from the, from the um, primary next week are going to be individuals that are not tethered to either candidate. To anybody, to just, right. So they're wild cards. So it's going to be interesting to see how the process goes. But I think if it's really close, how, how do you deny the will of the people? What do you make of the process so far this year? Your, your own re-election campaign has really not even gotten started yet. But Thankfully. At, at the, yeah. At the presidential level, though, yeah. what, what do you make of the race? It's way too long. I mean, I think we should go to a system like they have in Britain, for example, where there's a very finite window within which you can, can campaign, campaign and run for president or for any office. I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about... Uh, 
uh, uh, spending in politics. And I totally agree it's outrageous and out of control. One way to control that, let's shorten the season. Mm -hmm. uh, do you really need a two-year season to run for president? Do you really need to be vetted that long? I think if you, if you shorten the window, I think everybody would be a lot happier. And I think we would uh, probably get more substantive discussion on the issues than we, do, than we have right now. Well, speaking of the issues, let's get to a couple of them. I know uh, with your chairmanship of the subcommittee of the, the House Homeland Security Committee on Transportation, uh, there's been a whole lot of new concern raised ever since both Paris and then Brussels, and there's been some new legislation. I don't think it's gotten through the, 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 the Congress yet, but they came out of that committee that would tighten things up at our airports, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, well like some things have come out of the committee that tighten them up oh, at the airports. Uh, one thing was called the access controls, because on my committee, I realized early on, through a couple of high-profile cases, I can discuss the facts if you wish, that employees at airports get, get virtually no screening, hardly ever, uh, going to and from the secure areas of airports. And that's downright frightening. It, my, my concern for that it was the genesis of it was two cases, one in which uh, uh, an individual flew from Atlanta to LaGuardia Airport in New York 10 times before he's finally caught. Each time he had a backpack full of 15 to 17 guns loaded that he was selling on the streets of New York. Any one of those times he could have gone off on a plane and brought it down. Uh, he found out from that he got in the secure areas of the airport through his friend, who worked for an airline, would carry the bag in, meet him on the other side, hand him the bag, and get on the plane. Yeah. That and loophole has now been closed. No. I, well, I passed the House bill, mm -hmm. and it's called an access control bill. It's a comprehensive form reform of the how, how employees get access to airports nationwide. It's passed the House. It's in the Senate. It's picking up steam in the Senate. So we need the Senate to... to, to uh, pick it up and, and get it across the finish line to get the president. Is this fast. part of the bill that's part of the reauthorization of the FAA? It is. Okay. Yeah, you've done your homework. Right. Very well, good. I, but it's not done yet. The Senate's still wrestling with it. They're still wrestling with it, but there's several aspects of my bill that are in that. Yeah, so I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. So, you know, and uh, I think that's a really important part of it. Another one we're looking at from coming out of the committee that I'm going to get voted on next week and will be my ninth bill to pass the House, which I'm quite proud of, is a called the last point of departure. Because we saw from uh, airports, uh, there's two airports in the Middle East uh, that they've had bombs in planes recently. One brought the plane down, the Russian airliner. The other one was in Mogadishu, where it blew a hole in the side of the plane. Both of them had to deal uh, with uh, security lapses at those airports. And we're very concerned, based on what happened at Brussels, and more recently as well, that uh, we need to take a good, hard look at any airport where the planes are flying from that foreign country to the U.S. to make sure, darn sure, that their secure me security measures are up to snuff. And that's what my bill does. It's called Safe Operation Safe Gates or Safe Gates Bill. Right. And uh, that's why I'm looking forward to that, too. We'll take a break and talk more about Homeland Security and the threat from ISIS as well when we continue our conversation with Congressman John Katka after this.